Nigeria, the continent's largest economy, is now the first African country to adopt open banking regulations. The Central Bank of Nigeria issued operational guidelines for open banking in Nigeria just last week. Now, open banking refers to a financial services concept that allows third-party financial service providers to access banking data, typically through application programming interfaces with the explicit consent of the customers. Basically, operational guidelines are now outlining the procedures that will govern how banks and other financial institutions are permitted to access and manage customer data. The CBN has said that the guidelines were in the furtherance of its mandate to ensure stability in the country's financial system. What potential does this have for the banking and financial services industry? Joining me now is Uzoma Dozier, CEO and founder of Sparkle. Uzoma, welcome to Business Edge. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. So let's look at what was going on just a little bit before uh, these regulations came into place. But they follow, of course, a regulatory framework that has been in place for a few years now. But why does this seem like the logical next step in the evolution of banking and financial services in Nigeria? Um, thank, I mean, so I think before now, I mean, until we start even like um, rolling out, I mean, to open a bank account, one, you have to go, you have to, I mean, like now you have to actually connect to a bank and they have to get all the information from you and that's because they actually don't know you. Um, if you want to borrow money, um, this is based on your activity with the banks and so um, you, there's a tendency to stay with people whether or not you want to stay with them because all they have all your data. Mm. Now with open banking, it just, in fact, open banking completely redefines banking and now takes banking beyond the borders of what we know as banking. Why? Because one, to open a banking account now, because this is, a, this is an API driven strategy, which is a, a protocol, it's a standard protocol that open banking um, insists, insists on, which means that really I can, open, I, can, I can open an account much easier than before by giving permission to a participating organization mm. to, to pull resource, pull all the data from my existing bank and open that and open that account for me. I can tell an existing bank that has no data of my transaction capability to say, you know what, here here, here permission to look at all my transaction details so you can assess whether I am good for that credit. So automatically, if you think about it, it goes beyond banking because if because uh, open banking is not just for financial institutions but non-financial institutions that meet the requirements of these operating or open banking guidelines. So it's a completely revolutionary um, next step, which is really, I mean, I mean, personally scares the hell out of me, but I'm really excited <laughs> about it. Because if, you're, if you're a truly customer-centric organization, we're now mm. putting power back in the hands of the, customer, the customer and we're telling, the, we're telling the, 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 um, the providers of self financial services you know, start improving, improving your customer experience and, and all. So it's a completely new ball game. And I like the fact that you admit that it scares the hell out of you. So hopefully we'll have time for you to really tell us why uh, you're scared. So, of course, uh, in my introduction, I talked about the fact that this is allowing third-party financial service providers to access data uh, that typically they wouldn't have access to. So let's be specific now. Um, the policy is targeted at banking and other related financial services. And this is also to be classified and to be determined by the central bank. So who are the players that you see falling under these other related financial services? Who should be... Um, sort of on the table or on the board as this open banking regulation really kicks in? So practically beyond the banks, we're looking at financial institutions, we're looking at the um, PFI, um, we're looking at any pension funds, we're looking at insurance companies, we're also looking at um, PSPs and all um, super agents. So it's, and then if you want to stretch it further, we're looking at even companies, the fast moving consumer good companies, companies that you know um, have suppliers, distributors, because there, there, there is a ton of data that is stored by these companies. And one of the idea, one of the the the, um, the the objectives of open banking is to unlock data that has been siloed in organizations, so now people can actually use it to convert to information and make decisions. And that's what open bank, that's, that's the core of open banking. Mm -hmm. I want data to make, I want data from different sources to make a, 
um, to make a holistic um, decision on whether to move forward, backwards, stay where I am, yes or no, depending on the industry that you are in. Mm. And something I find really interesting is about this explicit part. So, uh, Uzoma, let's go to that. So, open banking involves the explicit consent of the customer. Uh, but if the regulations are just coming into place, people might be wondering, um, were third parties having access without customers' uh, explicit consent before? So, let's talk about really what was in place before these guidelines came into place. So, you know, data privacy, I mean, like, in the financial in financial sector, especially the area where we play um, licensed bank, I mean, uh, there has always been guidelines on how we use customer data, and because you know banking is, I mean, central bank has a role to play in terms of financial systems of stability, and that I mean the core foundation there is trust. So you're trusting me with your money, you're trusting me with your information. So there's mm -hmm. clear and strict guidelines. Take um, bank um, BVN for example. If I when a customer wants to open an account in Sparkle, we ask the customer's permission and we tell them we are asking for this information so that we can know who you are and open an account and also safeguard you. And we use it for that. And then that is it. We cannot use that information, give that information to a third party or, or the third party or use it again for any other thing unless we go back to that customer and get that permission. And that is what data privacy and protecting the customer by it. So it's an open market squarely put more power back into the customer's hand and and central bank is now extending this to other players who are not in the financial sector and say if you want to play in the open banking space you now have to conform to the rules and guidelines that we've always had in place to protect customers um, funds to protect customers data and to protect customers um, um, privacy in mm. line with the, the existing regulations so it is a better it, it, it will extend into the economy at large and will be better for uh, economic development. So what you're saying is that me and other Nigerian customers in the banking and financial services sector really should rest at ease because the issues around data privacy and cybersecurity, there are ongoing conversations in Nigeria. We've seen the issues around fraud, bank accounts being opened without people's permission, money moving. You're wondering how does this data get into the wrong hands? But open banking guidelines, from what you're telling me, will help to eliminate to a large part the majority of this. And there's going to be more ease and more security for Nigerian banking customers. Am I correct? No, very, very correct. Actually, in fact, it is it's very, very clear about the minimum standards of security that any player wants to act to. Um, if you want to partake, is a minimum minimum security standards, minimum data privacy standards, minimum KYC, anti-money laundering laws, mm. and so because you're only as strong, any ecosystem is as strong as their weakest link. And so we want to make sure if you want to participate, you must have these governance structures in place. So overall. Um, um, if you want to be competitive going forward and you do not meet these required standards, then you know the, um, the sustainability is going to be question questionable. Yeah. And if you are a business now who is raising money and the people are going to be looking for those minimum requirements, you have those minimum requirements in terms of security, in terms of, in terms of data privacy, in terms of the IT infrastructure, in, te in terms of your API, and what is your API strategy? Are you going to connect to different organizations to, to, you know, to access data for uh, customers' data if they want it so that you can do things? So it's going to make the industry more competitive and we should see better customer experience coming out of this. And, so that, and that's the exciting part. So if you're a truly customer-centric organization, you know, it's, there's going to be lots of work to do, but you know, it's going to give you that competitive advantage that you know, wasn't there before. So it's mm. a new, new playing field. All right. So I want to come back to the customer because there's also uh, the guidelines having a fact that they outline a consent management framework which mandates that customers must provide explicit consent before their data can be accessed for open banking products and services. And then you also have this consent, but it's not into property. It's not forever. That consent has to constantly, in a way, be renewed. And I find that really quite interesting because, as you said, it does put power in the hands of the customer. So let's look at this in terms of the framework. How does this consent management framework work? How will it uh, ensure customers have the best access to services, good services, and also are protected as well? So let me, and let me just use a very, like, let me use an example because let me just you know, blow it up, right? And so like to just show you why, you know, it's really terrifying. Let's say I am a supermarket and I have lots of customers. 
customers. And I think, you know, I actually want to start lending customers money. And so, you know, I would now invest in, I would now invest in um, the solutions and systems, right, to meet the requirements to participate in open banking. So automatically, if I, and then I have the right API. So I would now tell my customers, give me permission um, so that you can see your balances on our mobile application and I can lend you money. But you know, um, give me permission for one week or two weeks or three weeks or one month. And at the end of one month, you have to apply for permission again. So I, you know, like, so like I, um, I have a, a few, so like, to get, so, so that, that means automatically banking has now gone beyond financial institution to, to even non-financial institutions who already have customers. So if you have a customer base, you can now start providing services that you couldn't provide before because you now have access to the customer's information that will enable you to make decisions to say, yes, this guy is good for credit, this guy is not, because there are applications and software that can do that. And so it now, one, there's access to information, but and still at the control of the cost of the customer. And so that so so, so that why I say, you know, you know, it now takes banking beyond the bodies of banking. It takes mm-hmm. banking beyond what we knew who who were who were the who were the, the players in the banking space. Because in the end banking is only I mean banking is about transactions. It's about lending money and it's about keeping people's money. And mm-hmm. keep, people keep their money with you because they trust you. Yeah. So if I trust my supermarket, for example, because they always have things for me, they always care about me, they know me, or me say, Mr. Uzama, welcome again. How, you will do more things with them. And so, and, and we have seen this in other clients as well. So, so and then, if we, I know my customer, if I know my customer, they come to my, come to my shop, you know, when we start talking about financial inclusion and including mm. people and documentation, it just changes the complete the whole ball game. And okay, so, who's about, before you go to the financial inclusion part, because I, I, I want to share the data on that, but I, let me get to what I think is one of the areas that scares you. So a report by Allied Market Research said the market size of open banking is predicted to reach about $43 billion by 2026 at a growth rate of 24%. So we're seeing opportunities. Now uh, Nigeria is the first African country to institute these guidelines, also putting us ahead and also meaning that there's open access for all those on the African continent who want to play in this space with us. But what really are the opportunities in open banking for the players in the sector, for the players in the banking and financial services sector, for players like you? So, I mean, one of the first, one of the first things, it will, be, it will reduce cost. So, it's actually, you're going to see a change in the players in the market. So, today, if I wanted, if somebody wants to open an account with me and I want to do KYC level three, I would actually have to now get an agent or to go, to go and actually make sure that, um, he lives where he says he lives. But that information is already residing in three or four different banks. So all I have to do is just peel that information from that, from that organization, and that is it. So that cost of even KYC has actually dropped. The cost of opening the account because, you know, the data already exists in, 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 in a server complete, drops completely because, you know, less paper. In fact, that whole paper driven account opening any bank that even does that today is going to have to start questioning why they're doing that because even customers don't even want the new generation of customers coming up don't actually want to do that then you think of even for small businesses which are the engine of growth in nigeria and i guess that's where the opportunity is you mm-hmm. think of all the solutions when you think of all the business support service solutions that were very expensive for them to access now with api driven strategy it brings that down cash collection invoicing you know, um, even the collateral registry management, all that could be done better in, with an open um, banking infrastructure. And that would unlock capital and that would unlock opportunities for, for businesses because even their cost of doing business drops and their, that, that inclusion into the, um, into the, into the, um, uh, the society increases. Okay, so one of the things I find uh, in this also guideline is that the CBN itself, which is issuing the guidelines, is also required to establish and manage an open banking registry that will serve as sort of an oversight, regulatory tool uh, for participants who are in it. So how will this registry work? Because I know you've been involved uh, with the Open Banking Nigeria group that was about set up in, since 2017. So this has been a few years in the making, but how will the registry work? So let's the, the 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 central bank of Nigeria is a referee, and 
um, the, the referee and they are setting rules and guidelines. So, like, the registry contains the players in open market, and these players are broken down into the API providers and the API consumers. Providers are those who provide information, and those who also, and consumers are those who actually are asking that information. And organizations can be providers and consumers as well. Now, that's one bit. So, those are the providers. Second, the, the registry also outlines. The, the standards and conditions in which people will play, conditions from a concept management, data privacy, anti money laundering, KYC, even um, and, and, and that whole concept management that we were that we were talk, that we were, we were talking about. So if you're not to, for you to for you to say okay, I want to participate in open banking, then you must you, you must be in the registry. To be in the registry, you must meet you must conform to the guidelines, the standards that are required for you to play in that space. And that's basically it in a nutshell. It just makes sure, you know, that there's governance around it and that it's just there to protect that privacy, customer privacy, um, and ensure trust in the, in, in the whole initiative. All right, so you were about to go into uh, financial inclusion earlier, so let me bring you back to that. In the past few weeks, especially with this cashless policy that Nigeria has been on for the past decade or so, we've seen how the cashless infrastructure really seemed to buckle under the pressure that has come because of the Naira redesign policy. But besides that, we also saw that the CBN missed its 80% financial inclusion targets in 2020, and that was around the pandemic, and many people missed a lot of targets. But the World Bank's 2021 Global uh, Findex report shows that Nigeria's banked population increased by 15.6 percentage points to 45.3%. That's not half, which also implies that over 56 or around 56% of adult Nigerians are unbanked. How do you think open banking is going to change that? Okay, I mean, a simple example would be when I think of all those agents across super financial super agents across the country, those telco agents who have access to, um, to devices that can connect to that open banking infrastructure. So it means now that because... I can now onboard individuals who have, for example, because the whole idea of financial inclusion, first of all, is first of all, who's the person that wants to be included in the financial, financial sector and how can I onboard them? Now, there are probably more people that have um, PVCs, the voter registration cards, than there are that have BVN. Mm -hmm. And so now you might have a PVC. And so, like, you can now use that information. We can now pull that information because the more people that you have participating, especially, and it is important that actually government participate in, in, in open banking because they're, they're, they're a treasure trove of data. Mm -hmm. And so if you have that, so it means that I can now onboard people, not just based on you have to buy, have a bank given, you have to have a name. I can, have your, I can use any form of identity that's issued by government to say this person is part of the Nigerian or or is working in Nigeria, living in Nigeria, this is who he is, and he can be tagged, and we can now onboard him in a very cost-effective manner. No references, no um, where do you live uh, type of uh, questions that are expensive because there are no addresses. So it just completely changes the whole game. And the thing about it is that, you know, technology is a enabler. Now, mm -hmm. what you can do with it, right, depends on the business case, it depends on the situation, depends on the problem. So the problems in Lagos will come with different from the problems in Imo State. But one thing is for sure is that as long as that infrastructure is there and there is that know-how, the opportunities are boundless. All right, Suzoma, before I let you go, let's look at this. So while Nigeria is the first African country to implement open banking, it's been successfully done around the world. So open banking in the UK should have or most likely will exceed the 1 million customer mark. The country is also ranked first in EY's Open Banking Opportunity Index, which assess the readiness of 10 different markets around the globe to foster a vigorous open banking environment. Then there's the EU, where open banking helped bring about increased competition and innovation into the financial services sector. And then you have Australia, which opted for a regulatory-driven approach, which has proven to be critical in getting customers comfortable with open banking. So we're the first. I know many other African countries will want to learn from the things we're doing. But in order for us to guarantee success with this, what are the top three things you think, whether it's the CBN or the interested parties such as yourself, must do to ensure success of open banking in the country? Well, definitely, I think central bank must be you know, a very strict regulator, reward and punish. That's very, very key because, one, trust is very, very important. And, and 
you're asking, you're now asking the consumer who is very, very key in, um, in, in this process to give permission to people that they don't even know that, like, for example, Sparkler has just started to say, you know, give Sparkle my information. Two, I think education is very, very important. We cannot underestimate educating people, breaking it down, and on explaining what the opportunities are to different stakeholders in the system. And so, like when, I, when we talk about education, the banking, is, the regulate players in the in the regulatory um, environment, the private sector, and the, and, and the um, and the, and the business environment. And the third part is infrastructure. Mm. We have to see. Uh, t- uh, uh, telecom infrastructure are very key and vital, you know, to you know to facilitate things like financial inclusion, economic 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 growth, and and, and social inclusion. It is very very key. So it's that. So it's so it's the CPM key key very key. Um, the um, uh, education and then infrastructure and infrastructure. In my opinion. All right. We hope to see the success of this, especially bringing so many more millions of Nigerians into the banking services sector. And of course, making things cheaper for all of us who are partaking. Uzoma Dozier, CEO and founder of Sparkle, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. Nice to be on the show. All right. And while my guest says this is opportunities waiting for the banking and financial services sector, he also says it scares the hell out of him. And also, of course, there are expectations. 56% of adult Nigerians do not have a bank account. And in the past several weeks, we've seen the cashless policy infrastructure take several bows under the CBN's Naira redesign policy. So all of this being said, the CBN has announced the open banking regulations and guidelines, which are meant to take immediate effect. But hopefully we'll see some changes and some improvements in the banking and financial services sector that will benefit Nigerians. The customer, at the end of the day, that is definitely king.